Wow, you guys sound good today. Thanks for being here. Hey, so uh, here's what we're going to do. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Philippians. Philippians has been our guidebook for this climb, and we're kind of taking this from two tracks. We are reaching the peak um, money-wise through missions, kind of a, a, a monetary goal for missions, but we're also digging into the book of Philippians, four chapters uh, all the way through Christmas, uh, and, and, and dealing with, oh, Justin's getting his 3D glasses back. All right, so, so good, okay. So uh, dig, digging into Philippians, man, we're, we're going through here, and we're looking at um, the key elements in the letter of the Philipp- to the Philippians about what it takes in our lives to reach the peak, to kind of go higher in our life spiritually. Not just giving more, but like, like digging in more and, and, and climbing higher in, in what God wants us to do. That's what we're, we're thinking about through here. So um, today I'm going to talk about an attitude. So an attitude that increases altitude. And the, the key verse that we've used as our theme verse is Isaiah 52, 7. And it says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. And so in, in Philippians kind of thinking about Paul saying, I press toward the mark, toward the goal, toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So it's this this upward growth and and straining to be what God wants us to be, not settling in, but, but always reaching up, reaching further into what God wants. And so uh, Philippians, I said, man, it's got some, some key elements to this. Philippians is, is a phenomenal letter. I mean, you got it's four chapters. It'll take you a few minutes to read through it. And if you take the notes that I've given you today, there's a daily devotional that goes with it. So you're going to dive deeper into this on a daily basis. Day one, read this, answer these questions, pray this. So it gives you a daily devotional to work through. So you're going to go deeper. And then if you're in a life group, you're going to come in and connect with that. And, 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 and work through it. Or if you're not in a group that's doing that or you're not in a group, find some people. Get some climbing partners, man. You're not going to make it alone. We've been talking about that, how teamwork is important. So uh, we've been kind of taking these main elements. In the first week, we talked about cur- uh, teamwork. I need partners and prayer and perspective in my life. Uh, the next time we talked about it was courage. Last week, I talked about courage. I need courage that's contagious. I need courage. You know, and I, remember that last week we said the harness doesn't make you courageous. Right? Like, like putting that harness and knowing that you have a rope and that you have two guys that are holding that rope and you got a helmet on, that doesn't make you courageous because you still got to go up there, right? And, and so putting the harness on, so coming in here and feeling like, oh, I'm a harness, I got these people around me, I feel, I feel so courageous. Well, you don't need to feel courageous right now. You need to feel courageous when you get out there, right? So when you go and you say, man, I need courage to, you don't need God to, he's not going to just, just rip your chest open and go, courage. You know, he's going to say, okay, take a step. Take a step in that direction. Well, I'm afraid of that step. I know. So take it. And you take it. Then the courage comes as you take the steps. And so we're talking about that, that courage that's contagious. And Paul's saying, man, I'm going, to, I'm going to live for Jesus my whole life. But whether I'm living here, whether I die, which is better, I'm going to be courageous. And that, that kind of courage is contagious. But there's another thing we're going to talk about today. Attitude. Man, how many of you have ever had a bad attitude? Raise your hand. Come on. Come on. You've ever had a bad attitude? I mean a real bad attitude. I mean, how many of you right now, you got a bad, you got such a bad attitude, you are not going to raise your hand, okay? That's your bad attitude right now. I don't care what you say. I'm not raising my hand, you know? So I have people that, I have people that tell me that, and that's why I do that, because it ticks them off. Because they need to work on their attitude. I'm just helping them, you know? So anyway, this attitude. So how many of you, you, you've had, now what changes that attitude? You do. You do. That's the, that's the one thing that you can change. Your attitude. I love it. The, the, the saying says a bad attitude. I put this in your notes. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere until you change it. So some of you right now, today, you say, I got, you know, I came to church with a flat tire. I need to change that. I, I got a bad attitude. Tell the person next to you, man, you need to change your attitude right now, okay? So, uh, but I, I love the statement that says, attitudes are contagious, mine might kill you, okay? Um, another one says, I don't have an attitude problem. You have a perception problem, and that's not my problem. 
I don't have an attitude problem. You have a perception problem, and that's not my problem. But here's some good attitude quotes. I love this. Life has no remote. Get up and change it yourself. Oh, let's go home. Let's go. We're out. Life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% of how you react to it. Winston Churchill said, attitude is that little thing that makes a big difference. John Maxwell says a couple things. The greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility for our attitudes. That's the day we grow up. You know, it's, it's awesome to see little kids up here, right? They're so beautiful. Do we want them to remain like little children? You're like, yeah, we do, because they're cute when they're like that. But when they get big and they act like that, that's not cute anymore, okay? There's a group for that on Friday night, okay? So, uh, but uh, being childlike, being childlike, is, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. That's a good, like, spiritual principle, to be childlike, right? But to be childish, <laughs> that's a whole other thing, right? So we need, to, we need to change our attitude. We need to grow up and take responsibility for this attitude. John Maxwell also said, you can't be a smart cookie if you have a crummy attitude. There you go. All right. So let's look at Philippians chapter 2 because Philippians chapter 2, man, it, it just dives deep into this whole attitude thing. And so what I'm going to do is usually I read through it and then go back. I'm just going to read it as we go. So, uh, and I'm going to talk about four ways to make an attitude altitude adjustment. So number one, you have, a, you have some fill-ins. Number one, make your belonging to Jesus, make your belonging to Jesus the basis of your attitude. Now here's what it says in Philippians. It says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? So what's the answer to that? Okay, so some of you weren't paying attention. Is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ? Okay. Is there any comfort from his love? Is there any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? (laughs) Okay. That was real right there, huh? It's like, yes, yes, tender and compassionate. Yes. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy. Paul's writing this letter to the Philippians. God is writing this letter to us. He's saying, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Just those two first verses, verses one and verse two. Make your belonging to Jesus the basis of your attitude. And I I just look at it and I say, man, it kind of looks like... um, an if-then kind of statement, or the question, is there any um, encouragement? Is there any comfort? It's like there's this if thing, if, if this is the case, then, but it really is translated better since. Since there's encouragement in Christ, since you belong to Christ, since you are comforted in his love, since that, it's because of what your life in Christ has done for you. It's, that's what I'm saying. Your belonging to Jesus is the basis of your attitude. So if you don't belong to Jesus today, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're living on your own attitude. You're trying to figure that out. But we as believers in Jesus who have said, I belong to Jesus, I've given my heart, my life to Jesus, that actually makes a difference in your attitude. So, so I think that Christians should be would you agree with that? The Christians should be the most joyous people on the planet. Is that, is that not true? I mean, you guys are looking at me like, uh, I'm not sure what that means. How many of you are following Jesus with your life? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm not trying to embarrass him. But I'm just saying, man, if you're following Jesus, so wouldn't you be the most happiest, the most blessed, the, the most, uh, uh, you know, person that you'd want to be around. So, you know, the, this is the kind of attitude you should have. That's the attitude, man. Man, I have everything in Christ. And is there any encouragement to that? Yeah. So he's saying, man, there's encouragement or really um, in the Holy Spirit, we have inside of us encouragement and exhortation 
and the behavior that goes with that would be that we, uh, because we belong to one, we are like-minded. We're like-minded. It doesn't mean we agree on everything. It means that we have the mind of Christ, therefore we're like-minded. If there's comfort, and there is, then we are to love one another. So how many of you have been comforted by the love of Christ? Then love like that. That's what it's saying. There's fellowship in, the, in, the, in us together. We are a fellowship. And that means partners. Koinonia is the word. Shared life. That's why we call them life groups. Because they share life together. We don't just come in and, and exchange answers to questions. The life group is that we're going to share life together. Like we're a family, a spiritual family. So we are a fellowship, meaning that we are actually joined together, partners in Christ with one another. And then it says tender compassion, which is uh, kind of bringing those two together, tenderness and compassion, into one like element of your life. And that comes as a fruit from the Holy Spirit. And so then we're linked on purpose. So all these things together, man, if we belong to Jesus, we should have an attitude that takes us higher and keeps growing. Now, how many of you, okay, how many of you are followers of Jesus? Raise your hand. Keep that hand up. And I want you to raise your hand if, as being a follower of Jesus, you've ever had, still had a bad attitude. Keep both hands in the air. Woo! Swing them like you don't care. All right. Put them down. Okay. So, here's the deal. Here's my question for us today. If we belong to Jesus, what's our problem? Right? If we belong to Jesus, what's our problem? Yeah. If we, if, if we have Jesus in our life, and this is what it's saying, man, you have this. Paul's saying, if you have all this, he says, so then, he says, um, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly, uh, loving each other, uh, working together with one mind and purpose. We belong to Jesus. Let's make that the basis of our attitude. So here's the deal. Here's a real practical point. So this week, when you start having a bad attitude, or if right now you have a bad attitude, Nobody here has a bad attitude. I can tell, just looking at you. That's why you're here, right? Because you have a good attitude. But when you go out of here, this is the attitude building. You come in here, you have such a great attitude. It's like, how you doing? Oh, great. Doing great. You get out in the parking lot and out on the street, it's a whole other land out there, okay? It's a bad attitude area. You know, on the way to church, you know, on the way to church, you're driving to church. <laughs> then you walk through the doors, it's like, whoa. God bless you. Can I tell you about the Bible I was reading, the scripture I was reading this week? I just, oh, God is so good. So when that happens, not if, because I know when it happens, you go into your mind and you say, do I belong to Jesus? And when he says to you, yeah, you belong to me, then you tell yourself, you know what, Lord, I'm sorry for having a bad attitude. I got everything in you. I got nothing to worry about. It doesn't make life easy. It's just, you got Jesus. He's there with you, right? Are you with me on that? So, so, okay, before you clap, okay, because it's good to clap in here. I love, you know, I love, yeah, come on, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Let's do clap out here. Man, let's do that out in the parking lot, okay? Let's do that this week on the freeway. Let's do that. Let's, oh, thank you for cutting off me. Yeah, that, awesome. God loves you, and I'm praying for you. I'm praying that that cop pulls you over right up there. It's like, you know, hey, let's have that. Let's keep that attitude going because we're thinking, man, I belong to Jesus. So here's, that's the foundation. Now let me move forward on the, the choice part of this. So the second thing is you still, you belong to Jesus, but you still need to choose to be less about me and more about others. Look what it says. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. 
could you tell the other person next to you, just say, you are so much better than me. <laughs> I, I saw someone look and go, no, they looked at the other person, no. <clears throat> Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And it's kind of this. You know, my wife does this thing where it's like, instead of eating this, let's eat this. Instead of eating a cheeseburger, let's eat kale. I'm like, kale is from, uh, anyways, uh, kale is no good. But... Instead of being selfish, instead of being trying to impress others, instead of looking out only for me, it says instead of that, because you belong to Christ, choose instead to be humble. Choose instead to be humble. Think of others as better than yourself. Take an interest in others. Now, you know, last Saturday night, we had a great message from a guy named Dwayne Hughes, his army chaplain. We had a men's gathering. And he, man, I'm looking through this. I'm thinking, this is what he was talking about, being, knowing, doing. If you guys were here, the guys that were here heard that. Be humble. That's the core. That's the being. Think of others as better than you. That's the conscious thought. And then take an interest in others. Care, act, go, say, do something. So when, when you're, even when you're here, you can practice that here. You can practice that here. So you just be humble. You come in, you're humble, and you, you, you're, you're not trying to impress anybody. You're, you're just kind of um, looking for how God's going to use you to be a blessing to someone. Take an interest in someone else. You know how that works? A lot of times it just is like this. Hey, how you doing, man? What's your name? Leonard. Leonard? Yeah. Hey, nice to meet you, Leonard. I'm Ken. So, how long have you been coming here? Uh, this is my first time. This is your first time? Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yes, Lord. I already knew that. <laughs> but you know what? There's people that come into this building for the first time, for the 20th time, for the 40th time, whatever. They've, they've been here, and you don't know them. Do you know why? <clears throat> Because they have a bad attitude, that's why. <laughs> you know, because, you know, I like the people that sit in this row right here. But the people over in this section, they're really weird. These people right here. So, you know, I, I try to stay out of that section over there, right? I like this section. How you doing, man? That's good. All right. Okay. But what, what, what do we do? We, so, so when we do this thing where we say, hey, take a minute to say, say hi to some people around you, find the person you don't know and say, hey, how you doing? And they, hey, what's your name? All right, buy me lunch right after church today, okay? And we'll be friends, you know, whatever. Just take an interest. But some of you sit there in that chair and you're like, you know what? I'm really not an extrovert. Jesus didn't make me that way. So, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to sit right here. I, don't touch me. <laughs> don't make eye contact. I don't really like people. And we're like, we know, we know, okay? <laughs> but still, we come up and bug you, all right? So uh, it's just like take an interest in others. Now, it's not saying don't worry about you. I'm not, this is not saying in no way take care of yourself. It's saying don't only be about you. You got to help, you know, you got to be healthy spiritually. You got to be healthy physically. You got to be healthy emotionally. But it's not just about you here. It's talking about don't only be about you. Don't always think about you. It's not always about you. But it's not never about you. I mean, I, I know it's all about God, but you still have to take care of you, right? But it's not, it can't always, you got to come in here and you're, man, I want to, I want to find out about these people. I want to find out. I want to, I want to give myself away. I want to choose to be about other people. <clears throat> and you know, if you're like me, sometimes the people you hang around with determines your attitude. <laughs> Attitudes are contagious, <laughs> Okay. Now, we have the ability to change that, but we need, we need to, 
man, who are we hanging out with? And how are we being about more about other people versus just me? Jesus said this. He said, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. Jesus said, I want you to take my yoke upon. Let's yoke up together because I'm humble and gentle and you will find rest for your soul. So Jesus is calling us into a less unhealthy stress life, that life of trying to always make an impression on people, that, that I need to be good enough so that I, I work hard to impress people around me, or that life where I have to show that I'm better than other people. I've worked hard to be where I'm, I've gotten, so, you know, I, I wish everybody could be where I am, but, you know, I, I just, here's where I, because I'm here, I would never be like those people. Stop. Stop doing that. Unhook that unhealthy burden from around your shoulders, that weight you're carrying to try to be someone you're not, to impress someone who doesn't care. Let that go. Unhook from that. And it says, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Now, it's interesting. A yoke is an instrument of work, not rest, right? Right? So you, if you yoke, you yoke up with an, a team of oxen yoked together, they're plowing, right? So yoking up is not an instrument of rest. But here's the deal. So it's, it's still hard work, but you're working hard in the thing that Jesus has made you to do with him, and your life becomes joyful. Not necessarily easier, but you're moving in that direction with Jesus. And what is he teaching you? Be humble gentle. So here's the question. Man, am I being self-centered or am I other-centered? So we got the foundation. Man, I belong to Jesus. I got a choice to make. Am I going to be like Jesus? And that's where we go to number three. This is where I have to learn about the training part. Number three is practice the humility of Jesus. And here's the fill-in, give up to go up. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that name of Jesus, the, the name that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know, that was an ancient hymn. That was, they, most scholars believe that that right there was actually an early hymn of the church that they sang. And so they, they, God put that in there for us. This is the life of Christ. It's give up to go up. And it says you, you must have the same attitude. You belong to Jesus. You're yoked up with Jesus. You're going you're to have to have that same attitude. He gave up. He gave up. Now, what does that mean? So if Jesus is in heaven, picture Jesus in heaven, and he says, Father, I will go and die for these people so that they can come and be with us. So Jesus is God, the Son of God, and he um, comes down to earth, and he is, God is born as a human, as a baby. You know, it could have been that Jesus, that the Son of God just shows up on the planet as an adult, right? Could have been. But he humbled himself and he went down. This whole picture is of a downward humbling process. Goes down, taking on the form of a human being. And in that form of a human being, he's born in a stable, in a sense, in a cave, to a poor family. He's humbled himself down to the very bottom and then to go further, he humbles himself in, as a human into a form of a slave. And that slave is obedient to the Father every step of the way. So here's what it's saying. That even though the Son is God, 
He didn't become un-God by stepping down for us. He was still God in the flesh. But he added, he morphed that nature. That's actually the Greek word in that context, morphe. He morphed the nature to add humanness to it. He wasn't God less. He was God plus human nature. Okay? So he didn't become a human and he's no longer divine. He was divine, 100% God, 100% man. That's what that's saying. But here's where it gets the the most practical point for us because we're not God. You're not God. We're not going to be God. But he um, humbled himself, meaning that even though he was God and is God and always will be God, he did not look at his position as God, his position of equal to God, as something that he needed to cling to or grasp on or hold on to. He let go of the divine rights as God when he became a human, and he put his full life words, actions, into the will of the Father. So he's still God, but he totally submitted himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are equal, three in one, but he submitted himself to the Father and he was led by the Spirit. That's how we need to be like Jesus. We don't think of position as something that we need to hold on to. We don't think of our rights as something that we need to hold on to because we belong to Jesus. We can let go of that and we can be humble and take on the form or the nature of a servant. That's the attitude. Practice this kind of humility, giving up, giving up what I'm hanging on to. And and I know what some of you are thinking, well, you know what, I'm trying to be like that. Quit trying. Quit trying. Start training. Quit trying. Start training. So this week, again, when you, 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 all of a sudden something in here goes, you know what, but I have the right to, or I'm thinking, you know, I should be in that position of humble, serve, and watch Jesus walk with you through that. Therefore, God elevated him. He humbled. God put him in the position because he humbled himself. So therefore, the way up is down. Right? So the way up is down to the cross. Give your life away. Let God use it as an offering for him. Say, I'm trying to do like, I'm trying to be like that. I'm trying to have a good attitude. But you, pastor, you don't understand. You don't know the people around me. You don't know my spouse. You don't know my kids. You don't know my boss. You don't know my neighbors. And you don't know my parents. You don't know my pastor. I say, yeah, but I know you. Sometimes you're like one of the minions. You know, the minion said, I love everybody. Some I love to be around. Some I love to avoid. And some I love to punch in the face. That's a bad attitude, right? Not the attitude, man, but when we feel like that, we humble and train and practice ourselves with Jesus. The old, the old hymn by Isaac Watts says, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride. James 4, 7, and 8 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The last part of this is really what God's up to in your life and in my life. And that's number four. Let God work inside out to bring people on the outside in. It says, dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now, I'm, now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. 
Then it goes on to say, do everything without complaining and arguing or no grumbling so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to the word of life. And at the end it says, if you... Um, just like your faithful service is an offering to God, I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and will share your joy. So, so when we're talking about this, it's really the idea that God is working in you. He's not just left you alone to work on your own, but he's given you the trainer, the spiritual trainer, the Holy Spirit, to not only to, to work out what he's working in. And it's to work out, and not so that we can look good or be better or have such a great church. It's so that we can work out the things that are getting in the way of us going out and reaching people to bring into the kingdom. It's, it's working out the things that are getting in the way of shining bright in a, in a world that needs the light of Christ. It's working those things out so that we can go out and bring people into the kingdom. And it's this, this attitude of, I, I need to, to let God work in me and, and do the things that he wants to, me to do. And when I'm in that lane, then I'm, I'm experiencing the joy of Christ in my life. And Philippians over and over and over talks about the joy, the joy. Matter of fact, Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy, for who the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You guys uh, familiar with the Life Be Good t-shirts? Life Be Good? Uh, the company that, that put that together, there's two sons, uh, two, two boys that, that run it. Their name's Bert and John Jacobs. They founded, they co-founded this $100 million uh, Life Is Good t-shirt company. They grew up in a young, as the youngest of six children in a lower mid, middle class family in Boston. When the brothers were in elementary school, their parents were in a near-death car accident from which the mother managed to escape with only a few broken bones, but their father lost the use of his right hand. The stress and frustration of his physical therapy caused him to develop a harsh temper. They explain in their new book, Life is Good. He did a lot of yelling when we were in grade school. There were often difficult things happening around our house, the brothers wrote. But their mom, Joan, still believed life was good. So every night as the family sat around the dinner table, she would ask her six kids to tell her something good that happened that day. As, a, as simple as mom's words were, they changed the energy in the room. The brothers write, before we knew it, we were all riffing on the best, funniest, and most bizarre part of our day. Growing up with a mother like theirs, one who sang in the kitchen, told animated stories, acted out children's books for them, no matter what the bad situation was that they were going through, taught them an important lesson. Being happy isn't dependent on circumstances. She showed us that optimism is a courageous choice that you can make every day, especially in the face of adversity. As we close out today, Here's what I want us to commit to, because we're committed to climbing for Christ, right? So I want to I make sure that as we're a team and as we have courage as we're stepping out, that we keep that attitude of looking to Jesus. We belong to you, Jesus. We want you to show us how to be humble and learn from you and be gentle and give up so that we'll go up and so that we'll grow up for you. So I want you to pray with me. I think God's kind of hit you with a lot of things this morning. Children being dedicated. The power of that commitment. Village transformation in Honduras and seeing pictures of, of, of children that, that need more and need help and families that need help. Scripture that's talking about having an attitude, the mind of Christ, that mind that steps down into the mess and brings the love of Christ in humility for God's glory. And it's in that that we share in the joy of the kingdom.
But I don't know what's that thing that God's tugging on in your heart. Maybe you're here today and you've never personally invited Jesus to come into your life and take over. Maybe you're here today and you've done that, but you're, you've kind of wandered off the path a little bit and you need to get back on track. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, God, I just want you to lead me. I want you to send me out. I want you to show me that next step for my own spiritual growth to reach higher and further and deeper for you. So I'm going to pray. The band's going to play. And I want you to come up. If you want to you pray with someone, you want to accept Christ as your Savior, you want to just commit yourself anew, whatever you want to do. If you're on the response team, I want you to come up while I'm praying. God, we... Thank you for this time together today. We thank you for the opportunity to be together, to worship together, to love you together. God, to see what you're doing in our lives together. And God, we lay this before you today as an offering before you. God, that you would be pleased. God, that you would continue to work in us to be the people that you want us to be, to do the things that you want us to do, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.